Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome back. Hello, we're going to finish. We're going to, we're going to come to the climax of the afternoon. This is very, very exciting. It's, this, is the, this is the event that I was most excited about and wanted to, wanted to put on more than anything else. No pressure. Because, well, yes, no pressure. <laughs> Heather Shaw is a really a wonderful historian and she specialises, well, I'll let you describe it, but it's, it's, it's gangs, it's uh, street crime uh, through the centuries. Yeah, so I've worked for quite a long time on the history of juvenile delinquency. And when Dan originally and the British Academy originally approached me, it was to talk about youth street fighting gangs in the late 19th century, which have real sort of similarities, at least superficially, to the sort of knife crime and street crime that's going on today. And so when you hear about, because we all hear about in the newspapers, we all hear about on, on the internet, like people being stabbed in London particularly, but else, other cities as well, largely, um, what... Uh, and, and people, oh, what's, what are we going to do about it? For you, this is probably nothing new. Yeah, it's a really circular <laughs> debate. So over the sort of 20th century and into the late 19th century, there's these, these periods of concern about youth crime. You can think of the Teddy Boys or the Mods and Rockers. I don't know if you've ever heard about them. In, they were sort of fighting each other on beaches in the post-war period in the 1960s. But in the late 19th century particularly, there's a problem with territorial youth gangs, which becomes very violent, and it's in a number of cities, but particularly Manchester, uh, Birmingham and London. Now, why do gangs fight? Let's go right back to basics. In all of your studies, what, why do gangs fight? Uh, and, and are there similarities... From, from the 9th century right up to the present day? Or do things like drugs just change everything? Well, yeah, you, that, that, <laughs> basically. I mean, yes, there are superficial similarities. It's hugely territorial. It's in, I mean, obviously, you know, you could look at rural, 18th century rural France we have work on, and we have work talking about apprentices fighting each other. But these big groups of youths, it's based on urban society, very sort of dense housing, often very marginalised, so very similar to today. They are working because these kids say they're age 14 through to 21, so they've left the you know school finishes anyway in this period at, by that age. So they're working, but they're in semi-skilled or manual jobs, so they're very much at the edges of society in that way. And I think what the gang does, it offers them a sort of identity and a sort of home you know, so all the gangs in the 19th century have names. So in London, you've got the White Lion Street Gang, you've got the Lamb of Chad, Chaps, you've got the uh, City Road Boys. Interestingly, the Summerstown Lads, you still have a Summerstown Boys today, apparently, and certainly did in the late, in, in the 1990s. So they've got this identification. So it's a real sort of place to play out your sort of masculinity and to have some status that perhaps you're not getting in that sort of semi-skilled, manual work where you're very marginalised. And why why do gangs of... Are, are, there, are there females involved in these gangs as well? Yes, on the fringes. Um, they also often fight over girls. So in that sense, very little has changed. So there's a, there's a, in 1888, there's a murder, a gang murder in Regent's Park, so in West London, or West Central London, and a group of lads come together and fight, and one of the lads gets killed, but gets stabbed, and they sort of say, you know, in the evidence in the archive, it says, well, he walked past and he was looking at my girlfriend. And that, to me, sounds very similar to some of the accounts we hear about young people, you know, getting involved in gangs today. So that's, again, it's about status, it's about pride, it's about protection of territory. And so, so we, we know, so they fight about women. What else do they, f how would they come into conflict with each other? Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's interesting because they're very sort of, on one hand, you know, contemporaries talk about them being organised, but it seems to me they can come together. You could have literally one street in an area fighting with another street. So the White Lion Street gang will fight the lads from Bemerton Street and they come into fisticuffs. And I think there's an excitement there as well. You know, fighting is sort of quite fun, you know. Uh, it has its fun side to it. But sometimes you also, also get groups, gangs from certain areas, and they'll march down to another part of London. So there's a case, for example, where the uh, City Road lads join up with the Clark and Well Pistol Gang and the, and the White Lion Street Gang and march down to the Thames and look out for the Lambeth Gang. 
the Lambeth chaps and we've got these kids in the old Bailey which is available online and you can see some of the trials and some of these boys words they're saying things like you know we're the city road lads who are you are you the Lambeth lads and I mean yeah why do ki why do young people fight each other you know these are sort of time honoured rituals aren't they they're you know, we can go back way into history and see these confrontations, but what happens in the in the late 19th century and arguably today is that the police and the press become much more interested in them, so they become much more visible. That's interesting. So you think in other periods, if these gangs were killing, knifing each other on the streets of London in Tudor times or in the 17th century, polite society didn't really care, whereas what's, in, what's different about the late 19th century or today it's, it's bubbling up into, into it, everyone's paying attention to it. Well, yeah, and it is, we do have, like, descriptions of disorderly youths loitering around or fighting in the early modern period. But it's, you know, arguably it's a more violent society anyway. I think one of the things in late 19th century, you know, the streets, there's that attempt to be, become much more respectable, the sort of rise of respectable society. And so keeping streets clean, cleaning street disorder off streets. And so the last thing you want is these sort of rowdy youths trying to kill each other as you're walking along the street. We get some great, great examples of things like Pentonville Road, you know, up by Euston, and about the boys and girls um, doing what's called, sometimes called the monkey parade. And it's where they sort of walk down the street and push the sort of ordinary people, the Mr and Mrs Jones, off. So they're sort of walk. I won't do it, but because it'll be a bit embarrassing. But they walk along and they're sort of, you know, they're holding the street essentially, very sort of like aggressive. And there's lots of letters in the papers complaining about this sort of thing, this sort, that sort of thing, you know, about these young people and who do they think they are. Is that? I mean, that's what I love about historians like you. Your your area of research helps to shed light on, on the modern world. I mean, how important is it, do you think, that historians, your voice is being heard when we now debate knife crime and gangs in the modern world? <laughs> well, I would like to say it's very important, <laughs> obviously. We should all be asking you. <laughs> and, you know, there but are what many... what can you add to the debate, do you think? Well, I mean, if we talk about the... the, 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 the I mean, it's very difficult, the knife crime debate now, because one of the things you said when you opened is the big difference is that drugs are involved. There's no drugs in the 19th century. There's a bit of street gambling uh, and maybe a bit of drinking, but there's no drugs, and that makes a huge difference. So you've also got that connection to organised crime gangs as well now today. But... On the other hand, we do know what worked in the late 19th century in order to sort of help, sort of not, not exactly stop this sort of activity, but certainly to, you know, it definitely made a difference. And that was intervention at quite a young age. All the things that maybe have been, you know, taken away because of austerity. So things like... Um, Boys' clubs, that's a big thing, the sort of lads' club movement. In Manchester and Salford, where you have a lot of these problems, they set up the Salford Working Lads' Club, hugely important. Boxing is really popular, about channelling their energies into sort of fighting each other competitively rather than just trying to kill each other. Um, things like the uh, Boy Scouts or the Boys Brigade, those sort of movements that start in the late 19th, early 20th century. So there's all these ways. So rather than just put, putting them into the criminal justice system and making them into criminals, trying to intervene and actually keep them off the streets and keep them occupied. So that's what I love about what you do is that everyone's, at the moment, if you, if you listen to the press, everyone's wringing their hands going, what are we do? Whereas you're saying this has happened before and these are the steps that were taken, but I can't guarantee they're going to work this time, but this no. is what you can do to help try and mitigate this problem. Yeah, I mean, the other thing, of course, there were, there were ways that the criminal justice service uh, system dealt with them, but I don't necessarily want to recommend them. But the obvious one, and I don't know how many of you have, will have heard of Borstal, so Borstals were set up in the early 20th century precisely for this age group, for about 16, 17 through to 21, and everybody thinks of them, they, they run through to the 1980s, they close, they're abolished in 1982, and everyone thinks of them as these very harsh, horrendous institutions. But actually, in their very early days, they were very much aimed at trying to reform these lads and give them skills and train them back to, to be better citizens. So they started with this quite liberal sort of endeavour that then got lost over time. Um, 
I mean, on the whole, I don't think institutionalisation is a good thing at all. You know, do it, do it in the community, do it, do it on the streets with the lads. But yeah, is it? I mean, it's, is it the the fact that drugs are involved and therefore lots of money is involved presumably adds a level of complexity that perhaps wasn't wasn't there in the in the nineteenth century? I think so. I heard something. I heard a report the other day. I mean, it's quite disturbing about. Um, I can't remember where, where it was, whether it was in London or outside of London. I think it might have been Manchester, where young, bo- young children are actually being paid by older children to go and stab other kids as a way of... So they, they didn't have to take... So the younger children obviously wouldn't be prosecuted in the same way, so the older kids didn't have to take the punishment. And you just think, oh, my God, that seem, just seems so horrendous. And then there's all the county line stuff. And I think, yeah, it just makes it so it's so much more complex and so much harder to control. And it is like, you know, it's that overlap with the adult organised crime groups as well. I mean, some of our, you know, you do get young people in the 19th century who go on to be habitual criminals, but not in the same way. It's much more limited. So in the 19th century, you've got these young people getting in fights and knife crime being committed. Uh, what... what provokes the government to do stuff? I mean, is it government? Is it philanthropists? Is it local government? Who's setting up these clubs? Who's, who's, where's that coming from? Mixture of government, uh, reformers, through, through philanthropy, but also through, um, you know, people involved with those sort of proto-military groups like the Boys Brigade and so on, the sort of training groups. Um, I mean, the press make a huge deal of it. There's some terrible headlines in this period. I mean, one paper called the Pall Mall Gazette, which is actually quite a liberal paper, like the equivalent of The Guardian today, has these headlines about the savages of the slums, you know, and talks about, uh, describes the uh, gang activity as being a sort of terrorism. They actually use that sort of language. So there's quite a lot of hysteria about it. And that's not to say that it wasn't happening, but, you know, like these you know today as well these things do get exaggerated and they do um it when they get exaggerated it becomes very hard to sort of capture the nuance that you that you need to really look at these but yes there are a lot of people at local level churches as well sort of you know the the church is um very involved in the east end for example in the boxing clubs so in a way though do you want exaggeration because then government is forced to act i mean does that does that make government address the problem yeah but ideally you wouldn't have to force a government to (laughs) to address the problem would you you know um yeah but it must be interesting for you as a historian when so when people you you see those hysterical headlines today you must have a a smile to yourself or or, or you must you must think actually i've 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 seen i've the society has been through this before Yes, and I can think of early... I mean, my work, my PhD was actually on the early 19th century, the sort of period of artful dodgers, and, um, you know, young juvenile thieves then were described as being like stunted little men. You know, they were completely perplexed by these young children who they thought were really hardened in crime and how you dealt with them. So it's all, it's, you know, you hear the same thing really circulating and percolating through the century. So nothing is new under the sun. Well, that's a lesson for today about historians. Nothing's new. Um, is there going, anyone with questions or observations about gangs, knife crime to ask? If not, oh, okay, yeah, I was going to ask another question. There's a microphone coming. Here we go. Right at the back here. Right the, here we go, here we go. No, there's a, a mic. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think I've got a particular opinion on that, but I will say that when National Service came in, you know, in the original period, so, um, and, po- and you, you had it in the post-war, there was certainly, um, it was certainly linked to hooliganism and particularly things around the sort of concern about teddy boys. I don't know if you know about that. So, does anyone know about teddy boys? Yes, but you're a little bit older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the old people no. So, teddy boys, it's the Edwardian boys. It's a sort of, like, fashion around fighting, but also music. So, they dress very smartly in sort of crepe soldiers. And what decade are we talking? 1950s. 1950s. So, going into the 20th century. 
duck arse hair cut, so hair back here and a huge sort of duck's arse, you know what I mean, a huge quiff. Um, and they, their big thing was smashing up cinemas, so you have things called the rock and roll cinema riots um, in the 1950s. Um, and it's one of the first sort of youth cultures, and that is very much linked to, you know, we have to send them on national service to sort of stop them behaving like that. So it's often, yeah, national service where it's being used, and presumably in other countries, is often seen as a prescription to youth violence. Whether that, I don't know today, I don't think a lot of families would want their kids to go into national service, but I have no idea, to be honest. I'm not going to ask about personal experiences, but who in the room has had... Um, has had Exposure to street crime or gangs? Anyone in the room? Uh -huh. Oh, one, two. So yeah, some oh. people. Okay, and I'm not. Don't worry, I won't. Uh, I won't ask you unless you want to share any of your experiences. But um, any other questions? Any other questions we got? Yep, go for it, buddy. He's our good question asker. This guy. What's your name? <laughs> What's your name? Kieran. Kieran, thanks. Yeah. Give us another question. Um. What role do you think the recent rise in crime has, like, what link do you think the breakdown of the family has in that? I think the most evident example of this would be the breakdown of the black family in America. Mm. But here, what role do you think the lack of discipline and, like, fat, uh, father figures, what, what link do you think that has to knife crime? Again, it's quite difficult. I mean, I think, you know, you could sort of see things like austerity having an impact on the family, you know, leading to family fracture, not necessarily fathers, but just about poverty and how hard that is, people losing jobs, just how much stress that might put in the family, and then sort of having that knock-on effect. But in the late 19th century, they do say the same sort of things. They do talk about broken families. Um, and often you do find that sort of same fra family fracture. But, of course, in the late 19th century, you know, in terms of ethnicity, these are, you know, you have some Irish lads, but they're, you know, you don't have a black population in quite the same way there. There is a black population in London, but not, in the, not where these lads are involved. So I, I wouldn't deny that it might play a role, but I think... You know, each time this comes around, there's a new set of explanations, but there's some core things that, you know, are still the same as it go o over time. So I don't think it can be a whole uh, explanation for it. I mean, anybody else got a question? Um, in that case, thank you very much. Sorry, you, got, you guys... Was there a question? No? In that case, um, you guys have just joined us, so sorry about that, but you've missed a fascinating talk, so, so but, uh, you can catch up afterwards online. Thank you very much indeed for coming and giving us. That was great. Thank you very much.